Hello, Hello and, and welcome. <laughs> oh, you're doing it. Okay. That's fine. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, usually do. <laughs> I, I thought I... Okay, you continue. <laughs> no, no, you, you could go. You go. I like this. We'll leave it solid. You go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello and welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Slow and stop. Hello and welcome back to Slow Pit Stop. This is Muhammad, and as you've heard from my co-host Arafat, we are joined uh, with our guest Adam. Uh, Adam, how are you doing? I'm awesome, guys. It's a beautiful day. Oh my god! In Boston, the sun is shining. The boats are on the Charles, and Max Verstappen is driving his heart out. Like it couldn't be better for a Red Bull fan. This is a good day for you, yeah. Adam, because not only are you a Red Bull fan, so you must be happy that Verstappen won, but you're also a Canadian and we are just coming out of the Canada Grand Prix. How was it seeing your country represented on Formula 1? Ah, oh, it's so nice to be back and and the, the beautiful thing is that it's clear that everybody else feels this way. You know, you saw Max saying we should race here for many more years. Lewis loved to just get out there again. Um, honestly, there's so much fondness for this darn track. I think it's a top five. I think we yeah. can defensively say even, even, I, you know, I think I somewhat prefer street circuits of late and even so this traditional track just really, it Adam, I have a to question be for you. among the pantheon, please. Apart from this track, what are, what are the top three things about Canada as a country, as a whole? Can I answer? Oh man. Yes, go ahead. Top three things about <laughs> Please, I want to hear it. top three things about Canada. Number one, they're not America. Number two, uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much all I've got. All right, Adam, back to you. <laughs> all right. So normally when I'm at home, I'm on call, so I'm still in my scrubs. But I would usually pull back my sweater to reveal my Bernie Sanders T-shirt, <laughs> which would help you to understand. Uh. So, so I'm a big welfare state liberal, one of those jerks. <laughs> so probably that would be number one for Canada. And then what are the that's back, actually true. What I'll other give you that. I actually in love about Canada? Uh, probably you know that whole cosmopolitan thing. We do the cultural patchwork rather than the melting pot. So our like, multiculturalism is really more on our sleeve. I love that. Toronto used to be the most multicultural city in the world. Might still be. Just just a total blast and just like a very safe and supportive place. And then just to throw down a random curveball, I'll say Schwartz's Deli in Montreal is number three. Best smoked meat in the world. Uh, just why is, so why moist. Maple syrup not got a mention. Yeah, you know, the, that joke comes up a lot. I don't know. Oh, that it's I not really a joke. Like syrup, My favorite Krispy Kreme is the maple syrup Krispy Kreme, and they've is not that made right? it for years. How can you I'm talk devastated. about Canada and donuts in the same sentence and not bring up Tim Hortons? Why would you. Why would you besmirch Tim the Horton good name? Tim Hortons has only started recently coming to the UK. Okay, but you like have locations. Money. There's a location in Glasgow, Arfa. You can go. I've been to it. They're, yeah, they're okay. They're, they're, they're iced they're coffees are okay. around every corner. Whereas Krispy Kreme's is everywhere. I think I've actually been to that location in Glasgow <laughs> as well. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maple, for me, I like a maple glazed ham much better than a honey glazed ham. But otherwise, you can keep most of your maple I'm afraid. Adam, I've got a question for you. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of family in Ontario, and they have all mm-hmm. unanimously told me that the rest of Canada hates Montreal and Quebec. Can you shine some light on why that is? Yeah, yeah I would say they don't hate Montreal because Montreal is kind of an Anglophone city, but Quebec they certainly do. And I think there's, there's supposed to be a lot of snootiness and entitlement about being French and, and being Francophone and having that culture. Um, which you could, you could take or leave. I think it's kind of a nice aspect of our culture, but I think for some people, they think a lot of entitlement comes with it. And in some cases it's literal. So it's a have not province. Mm-hmm. So a lot of taxes in Ontario and Alberta go to Quebec to fund their infrastructure. They're still paying off the incredibly bad deal they got on the Olympics, which is many decades ago now. Mm. So uh, there's a lot of resentment about that. So that may, might eclipse anything that you might find quaint about having a pseudo European province in, in Canada. Why did they decide to sing their national anthem in French? Um, did they? Was it the Quebec anthem or was it the Canadian anthem? I didn't really Oh, I actually part. don't know. That's a good point. It could have been the Quebec piscine. anthem. What was it? I don't know or because they, they did know. sing in English later, Oh, Canada. My home and native land. Yeah. But before that, there was something in French, and I just assumed it was O Canada in French. 
Maybe it was. I hope it was. Did it start with O Canada? Because I don't know. I missed. I missed the first couple through. seconds. I, I came in halfway through. <laughs> That's so funny, dude. Yeah, I wasn't actually paying that much attention either. You know, on F one TV where you go from the pre race show to the current race show, yeah, and you have to switch your, yeah. your speed. Yeah, something similar like that happened, which is why I missed the beginning. Um, but okay, that's it's good to know that uh, you know Canada is united against Quebec for no Speaking particular of pre-race shows, should we get into some of the drama that happened before the race even started? Yeah, so I think, you know, our podcast covers a lot of good ground, and I think we take a very sensible approach to a lot of different topics. One of the areas I'd like to see us uh, develop in and get better at is Formula One gossip. I didn't realize that there is (laughs) so much Formula One gossip out there, and other podcasts do a great job of covering it, and we never talk about it. So, starting this week, I'm going to bring up a tidbit of Formula One gossip every week as much as I can. This week, we had an episode of the Real Housewives of Formula One. Apparently, there was a team principal meeting to discuss the technical directive that we'll get over, we'll, we'll cover in a minute, uh, to address the porpoising and Lewis Hamilton's poor back. And uh, I guess the team principals aren't all united in whether or not we need a uh, technical directive. So, uh, <laughs> Toto Wolf became very vocal and he had an arguing match with Mattia Binotto and the Netflix cameras were there to record the whole thing. And uh, they got the whole thing on camera. And at the end, Christian Horner went, you did that for the cameras, didn't you? You hammed it up a bit for the TV. I guess some people want to be reality TV stars. Wow. Who would have thought? What do you guys think about this? That seems weird to me. You know, if he just got into a fight on camera with Christian Horner, I would have been like, yeah, whatever. It's just those two being those two again. The fact that he went after Mattia Bonotto, who just seems like, I don't know, a sweet... Yeah. Um, do you know, but that's the animal what kingdom, does he right? You? So a you sweet have, old man, yeah. You have this animal kingdom phenomenon, right? So you have Toto, he's the entrepreneur, which he never lets you forget. You have <laughs> you have Christian, who is the ex-driver, or ex-racer, and then you have Mattia, who's the engineer. So as a business bro, you do have to constantly bully the nerdy engineer. Like that's just... <laughs> And you actually can see that in some of those principles interviews. Mattia is so mousy. Yeah. I can yeah. just see it. Mattia, that is so not right. I can't wait to see it. No, Mattia, no, no. That That is a triggering sentence for fans of Mercedes. I don't appreciate that. I know, but it's so good. Uh, the, re- the remixes are the best. Yeah. All right. So that is our gossip portion. Moving though to the technical directive. Okay, so let's talk about this. Mm-hmm. Has Mercedes sort of backfired? That's kind of been what I've been hearing on Reddit and Twitter and stuff. Mercedes was pushing for this change, and now they've got a change that's going to hurt them the most. But honestly, I don't know that it would hurt Mercedes the most. It feels like it would affect all the teams except for Red Bull equally. What do you guys think about this directive that you're going to have to raise your ride height if you can't stop the oscillations? Yeah, so initially this technical directive came from the FIA, which was about the porpoising problem. And the porpoising, as we all know, occurs because if your car is too low, it gets sucked into the ground and then bounces up and down as you get to a critical downforce level. There was an argument from a variety of drivers that on health and safety grounds, this is going to be damaging to their spines um, or just their health, you know, bouncing up and down like that. They're like, this is unsafe. Now, there's lots of things that a Formula One car does that is unsafe, um, that we don't make safe, uh, even though we could. One example is anti-lock brakes. We don't have anti-lock brakes on Formula One cars, even though they're much, much safer. But it's because it adds an extra challenge to the drivers and it lets them show off their driving skill. There's nothing about porpoising that allows a driver to show off their skills. It's just random bouncing, which, you know, from their point of view is a nuisance. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's all this talk about, okay, we need to change the way the cars are set up or the rules or something or the way the suspension is so that this bouncing stops. If it was just on competitive grounds, you could say, well, Red Bull got the job sorted. The rest of you Mm -hmm. didn't. Tough. Red Bull's done a good job. They they don't deserve to have that taken away. If they said, look, from next year, we're going to change it to bring the pack together a bit, I could understand that because Red Bull would get to have their spoils this year and next year they tried to close the pack up. 
Mm -hmm. The health and safety thing is interesting. So today, because I'm a man of education, I (laughs) went to an occupational lung disease clinic today um, and sat in with my friend Ruth. Um, Ruth's a consultant in respiratory and occupational For people outside the UK, a consultant is a type of doctor. I know I didn't know that either. (laughs) <laughs> the consultant is the equivalent of attending in the states and staff in Canada. So there you go. There's all three co- covered. So I was talking to <laughs> Ruth about the porpoising and the bouncing, and she said there's something called whole body vibrations, which is a problem in agricultural industry. You know, people that drive mm. tractors and things yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. And she showed me stuff online. So what was it? HSC? So Health and Safety England or something. Um, and they have some guidance on how much you're allowed to vibrate uh in vehicles and buses and trucks uh and they even have an excel sheet where there's a calculator wow. where you put in the meters per second squared of x-axis y-axis z-axis and it tells right. you if you hit the maximum limit so the formula one cars are clearly going to go over that um mm-hmm. so there is a health argument to be made for this level of vibration which i think yeah. is why the fia is putting something through now they didn't want to be seen as capitulating to Mercedes', Mercedes. demands because clearly yeah. Mercedes are the ones that are suffering from this the most and it's having a mm-hmm. sporting effect on them as well as, as well as a health one. So rather than saying, right, everybody has to have a minimum ground, ground clearance of X, which would get rid of the problem, they've said, we're going to enforce how we are checking the, the bottom of the car and we're going to start measuring these oscillations and a maximum number of oscillations is going to be allowed. And so it almost puts the onus on the teams that says, you need to fix this. And if you can't fix it for your driver, you have to raise the ride height yourself. We're not going yeah. to make other people do it. Yeah. And actually, all things considered, I think this is the fairest mechanism um, that they can do because they are prioritizing driver safety and they're putting the onus on the teams to deal no, but with the I issue. Think, I think there was a leaked version, like a leaked draft version of the technical directive that came out and it said you would have to raise the ride height, which would negatively impact uh, like Mercedes and not so much, maybe Ferrari as well. It would bring, it'd pull Ferrari back. That's the interesting thing. I'm sure that's why they got angry is because Charles is saying, oh, this doesn't bother me. Um, and so he finds it totally tolerable and they yeah. have a great advantage. You guys have... All of this, like, you know, sky is falling, talk about how Red Bull are going to run away with the championship, but I think it's still oh, incredibly, are. incredibly close. Mm-hmm. Um, but but this change, you know, if it had to be affected over the course of this season, would be very detrimental to Ferrari's hopes. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's going to be very tight to the end, you know. Well, we can get to I that I think there was a lot of stuff. So I was mm-hmm. listening to the race podcast, and they were talking about how maybe Mercedes somehow found out information earlier because you can put, like, a second floor stay on the car maybe and mm-hmm. mercedes were the only people that showed up with one to canada like i don't even know what a floor stay mm. is let alone what it does they also showed up with a floor that had like a giant hole punched into it put it on for like two laps in fp1 it was horrible and <laughs> they took it off yeah. so i don't know what they were thinking with that you know it's funny because like we were saying before they don't have infinite money to just throw at this problem to make it go yeah. away but they've definitely given up on this year so they're just throwing infinite money at the problem to see what they can make go away because sure. now they they have no reason to make this car good for this year i think they're focusing fully on next year yeah i have to say when i listened to your pod your last podcast azerbaijan loved it loved every moment of it but awesome. when you. you were talking about uh you know rolling you're changing the regulations you know other than for health reasons, that definitely bugged me because, you know, obviously Mercedes benefited greatly from having regulations that favored them for, you know, essentially seven, eight years in a row. So I was like, come on, guys, you know, if they built the best car, they deserve it in much the same way. You may have to deal with eight years of Red Bull winning, although I do think it's very close with Ferrari anyway. Hmm. But I do think that if there's a credible, you know, health concern, you know, we can't take it just on Lewis's radio calls alone, but it is, it is obviously troubling to watch um you know if that really is credible then i think that this is a really i agree with arafat a very fair intervention Mm -hmm. that affects most teams equally and you know we Mm -hmm. have to probably take a ruler to red bull too because you see them it's not like they don't bounce at all i watch every you know weekend debrief and they show the oscillation graphs and -hmm. sometimes red bull is you know not even the not even the team with the least oscillations Mm -hmm. so 
yeah, I think it's a very yeah, fair I think, ruling. I think this week in Canada, everyone was bouncing. Like, if especially going mm-hmm. down the main street, you could see it. Like, all the cars are having a little bit of vibration to them. So I, I don't think anyone can say that they don't have the porpoising. And I like the argument that some people have been making that we don't want to see this as fans either. Like, it is so annoying to go on yeah. and onboard and you hear the... And you don't see the head going up. Like, it's annoying. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to see, if not, probably not this year, but at least from next year, if they do change the regulations to eliminate the porpoising, I think it would be a huge step forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that this, this regulation is fine. I like the idea that, hey, we're in a ground effect era, figure it out. And if you can't, yeah. you can't hurt your drivers just to keep up the pace for now. Because, like, you know, like it or not, that's, that was kind of the early days of the last, you know, the last turbo hybrid era was just mm-hmm. nobody else could figure it out. So Mercedes charged off in the distance. It's still dreary. I don't even want that for Red Bull. I want duels. I want every race yeah. to be like Jetta. But, yeah. uh, but honestly, you know, I like the fact that this is obviously a new engineering challenge Mm -hmm. and I have every confidence that Ferrari and Mercedes at the very least will catch up. And as we may get to, I think Alpine's probably also on the trail of doing so as well. So I I like to think that maybe it will be a tight, a tight, uh, you know, front runner pack once folks have sorted out the ground effect thing might take a year or two, but that's not the end of the world. Oh, and by the way, I thought you must ask your consultant mentor, if body oscillations, vibrations are so bad, then why are they also the first line therapy for mucus plugs? Are they don't riddle me this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's some argument for a small amount of oscillations and vibrations. There, there was a study that like some degree of body vibration increases um, testosterone levels and is good for osteoporosis and things mm-hmm, like mm-hmm, that. But mm-hmm. it's that J curve of... Do a little bit and it helps. Do a lot of it and it's it stops being helpful. Yeah, we need to get people oscillating. <laughs> they need to figure <laughs> out the exact oscillation level that boosts your performance and leave yeah. it at that. <laughs> leave it at that. I think that level is water aerobics, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. <laughs> if you talk to middle aged patients enough. I, I am yeah. glad though that Lewis's four herniated discs have gone back into place and he's no longer complaining of uh, back pain. Cause uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, man. one week turnaround. It's a medical miracle. For better or worse, that guy is the best on the microphone, at all <laughs> times. <laughs> so we start at the beginning of Lewis's weekend in qualifying. Yeah. So I I really enjoyed qualifying. I think you know going from the wet to dry, it, it adds this whole extra challenge in that you have to be on the track at the right moment, and whatever lap you're doing has to be perfect because it could suddenly be the last lap. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really like qualifying, you know, going from wet to dry conditions. I think it's always really good. Or when a track is rubbering in, I think the worst qualifying is when the opposite happens, when the best grip is at the beginning and then it starts to drizzle or whatever else and the grip starts to go away. Whereas this way of grip getting better, 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 and the driver's getting faster and faster and faster, taking risk, making mistakes. I, I really enjoyed qualifying. Yeah, I thought it was really good too, and I thought Alonso really did do well. He was consistently putting it on this on the uh, front row, like he was just fast. And I think it was just being in that wet pace. I think the Alpine itself has been borrowing some features from the Red Bull over the past couple of races, and they've been trying to modulate Red Bull's design. Same with um, Aston Martin has been trying to do that. So I think it was paying off for him, and I think he was a very well deserved second row I do want or first row I do want to say that Verstappen had that qualifying under lock like at no point was he ever under threat of losing a pole position he was just consistently faster than everyone else and I think it's been like that all weekend so like you know getting to the race which I know we'll talk about later but I was pretty impressed that Carlos was even able to keep up with Verstappen I just thought the the Red Bull was so much faster um and Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know what do you think adam yeah i mean it was really exciting Uh, you know first of all you know in fp3 when we saw the old war horses at the top there saw fettel and uh, alonso at the top with gasly it was really exciting would have been cool to see to see lewis there too because it really shows you you people often say that the wet really brings out those experienced racers it's a great Mm -hmm. equalizer and and i absolutely loved seeing it and so similarly in qualifying, I was very disappointed that um, I guess we now understand that the Aston Martins had a bit of a technical issue as the weekend mm-hmm. went on. 
So we really didn't get to see Fettel's pace, but certainly the star for me was seeing Alonso as, as well as, you know, Carlos did as well. So Alonso just, you know, drag that Alpine, albeit very strong on the straights as we're increasingly discovering, you mm-hmm. know, into the top three it was just, just stellar. Uh, he's kind of a controversial figure, you know. I, every it seems like every yeah. race he's getting in trouble for being a little dirty. Um, yeah. Probably because he's a bit he's checked out. You know, he F1. was promised a competitive car for 2022 and didn't quite get it. So he just has no misgivings about trolling. I think but... he's. I think he's bitter because, like, you know, I think mm-hmm. one of the episodes in the past, Arfat said it. Like, he's five points away from five world titles. He's just been so unlucky and has had so many small things keep him from being much you know, bigger than he is. And I think that a lot of that frustration is still there. Last year we were talking about how mm-hmm. cool and calm and collected he was, but I think it's because he knew he was waiting for this year. And this year he's been a little bit of like, you know, like the Formula One bad guy, like, you know, getting on the radio and like uh, making public yeah. statements. And, you know, I think, and I, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit of the old Fernando's back. Totally agree. Totally agree. But it's still very exciting. Can we just to talk see about the most important moment of qualifying? Yes, please. And Adam, as our Red Bull representative, you might be able to give us some insight into this. Charge on. Let's talk it. about Perez's walk through the forest. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I that? saw you guys post about that. I actually thought it was very fun. You're like, why are they making him walk back? Don't they often, <laughs> though? Or is it only during the races? Yeah, but why is he walking through a forest? Yeah, oh, he yeah. offered the bike. And yeah. uh, he said, no, he said, I'm going to walk. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's the, that kind of um, adrenaline soaked decision where you just make a snap call and it's a really dumb one. Or, <laughs> or maybe he was... has spiders and snakes. Why are yeah. there giant spiders and snakes? Yeah, they're Canada, like, if this was if this was later in the summer, the Canadian spiders would be there and he'd have to fight them off and spot them off. I think it's funny that there's like a rope for him to hold on to so he doesn't get off the path. Like it's like he's proper off-roading, and he's just trying to walk back to the pits. I don't know. Yeah, it was very peculiar. Know. He uh, must not have known what he was getting himself into, or either that, or he had to blow up a lot of steam. Yeah. <laughs> and so what the a last thing I want to say about qualifying. Ah, uh, rough time for Sergio. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, the last thing I want to say about qualifying is, um, obviously Mercedes had a good result with Lewis Hamilton getting on the podium, um. But what I think actually they were still about 0.7, 0.8 seconds a lap slower than Ferrari and Red Bull. And I think mm-hmm. the safety mm-hmm. car helped pull the leaders back towards them. Otherwise, they would have just been in sort of no man's land by themselves. And I think Mercedes, the battle between Russell and Hamilton is being won on Saturday. You know, Russell had this whole Mr. Saturday reputation. I think a lot of it is because, you know, they're trying alternate setups and things. And we know this week Hamilton was experimenting and had a different setup again. Um, but I think whoever wins Saturday goes on to win Sunday. Although there's a lot of mitigating factors, the different setups and whatnot, I think qualifying is probably the weakest part of Lewis Hamilton's arsenal. And that sounds strange to say because, you know, he holds a world record for most pole positions. But I just, I don't know, you know, in my mind, when I think of people that qualify amazingly, mm-hmm. my brain still goes back to Red Bull Vettel. Yeah. And with Hamilton, whenever you were watching qualifying, you never knew if it was going to be him or Rosberg. You know, it was always kind of close between them. Whereas when Vettel was in that Red Bull, you knew Weber was never going to get pulled. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I, I don't know why. I still think that qualifying is not Hamilton's well, he, strongest No, part. I think he... I, I think, you know, I was saying this before. That actually, the last time Adam was on, Hamilton has a skill where in qualifying when he's finding the groove in that last lap of Q3, he can pull out like two tenths of extra pace and put it on pole. He can do that. We've, we've seen him do that before. And I think what's going on now is he's taking these experimental setups. Plus he's got a car that he's not used to. So yeah. that's putting him behind. Look, when, when Russell pulls the experiment, he qualifies eighth, you know, when it's yeah, Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying Hamilton is bad. Like mm-hmm. if you had it's a okay, top Trump's that. card, you yeah. know, Hamilton's race pace would be 10 out of 10. Hamilton's overtaking would be 10 out of 10. All these stats would be 10 out of 10. I'm just saying, because qualifying, I'd give it 9.9 out of 10. Sure, Valtteri yeah. could If you had him to have one weakness, I think it's there. But 
it's not that he is weak in qualifying. It's just of everything. No, no, I, that he I, does. I don't think. Yeah, yeah. So I, I see what you're saying, and I just think that you know, in the future, like let's say Silverstone onwards. Silverstone is when Mercedes is supposed to come out with a massive upgrade package. Like you know, it's supposed to be everything that they've been building towards. It's still yet yeah, to see so. whether or not. Yeah, it's like I said, it's yet to see whether that package will emerge. But that's what is supposed to happen. If that happens. Let's say it doesn't fix all the problems, but it fixes it enough that, you know, he doesn't need to mm-hmm. collect data every week. Then I think we can see Hamilton and, and Russell really fight for qualifying positions. But I think you're right, because had Hamilton qualified ahead of Russell in the last few races, that would have been his podium each time. So it's really just whoever qualifies ahead tends to be the one that finishes ahead. And uh, I, I think that's just what we're going to see going forward. And like I was saying before, I do think we've reached the point now where Mercedes is saying, you know what, we're not really focusing on anything beyond P3 and the constructors, and we're just going to, you know, fix this problem from now until the end of the yeah. year so we have a good car for next year. I, I don't see them realistically pushing for beyond that. Speaking of qualifying ahead and finishing ahead, should we talk about Verstappen versus Carlos? Yes. Um, should we I think that for... was great. You know, the last few laps, I think it was really, really good. If, if, if To our listeners... Adam has disappeared, um, much like Sergio Perez's engine. <laughs> and I, we, are, we are patiently awaiting his return. <laughs> so what did I miss? Are we still talking about maple syrup? I'll, I'll send you a, a 12 yeah. or if you send me Iron Brew. Yes. Uh, we, we were talking about Verstappen versus Carlos, and I was saying the last 15 laps I thought was amazing. You know, that tension of can Carlos do it? Can... Verstappen hold them. The only thing I would change, because there was a lot of cat and mouse going on about charging the battery versus when you deploy the battery, and I'm sure the graphics were there, but you know, in the excitement of it, I probably wasn't seeing when people are deploying their battery, when they're charging it up, mm-hmm. and I think that would add something to the viewers to be able to see yeah. a little graphic yeah, that's showing that, I'd love like that. they used to, you know, in 2009 when they had the Kurs thing, you could see it, the green bar charging up and then deploying. Mm-hmm, yeah. Just something to let us see what the drivers are doing. Probably yeah, you wins. know, I I was trying to I was trying to even look at the back of the cars to see when they're harvesting, but with the angle changes and stuff, you can't always get a good shot of the back of the car to see like when they're doing that. But I think it would be really really cool. And one of the suggestions people have had online about like improving Formula One and improving DRS is having like two minutes of DRS that you can use throughout the race, and mm-hmm. you just get to choose when you use it. So it's not just in certain areas. So you can use it to defend, you can use it to attack, but it's two minutes for everyone. And I think in a battle like this, had that been the case, when you don't know when the other person is going to use DRS, I think that would have been really, really cool. Um, I think it would have hmm. really made this battle more lively. Because like, imagine Verstappen's in front, and he doesn't know when Carlos can hit DRS and just gain that extra bit of power. And same with Carlos. you know, He doesn't know when Verstappen can hit DRS and just get out of that, you know, gap. So I, I think that would have been really cool. But I did. That's like what it was like with Kurs back in like two thousand nine, two thousand ten, when they used to press Kurs. You didn't know when the other driver had it or didn't have mm-hmm. it. Oh, so why has that? Why did they take Kurs out? Is it because they introduced DRS, so they took took away Kurs? Yeah. So the Kurs got automatically incorporated into the new hybrid system. Hmm. Because that's what the hybrid system was before the yeah. sort of 2014, right. 2014 regulation. They had this battery power and then they would use it to give themselves a little bit of a boost. And then right. they went with much bigger hybrid engines right. just to deliver constant power rather than a tiny bit of a boost. And, you know, I think Formula E does that now, too, with their battery boost. I think that would they have like the overtake button or something. Or yeah, they still have overtake. an overtake button now uh, in Formula One. But that's the thing. We don't get to see when they're pressing it or not mm-hmm. pressing it. Or if we do, the graphic is so small that I've not really noticed it. No, that yeah, we don't get to see it. I think it would be really cool to see. And I think put more power in the overtake button and, you know, maybe depower DRS a little bit. I think that would be really, really cool. But I like the battle between Verstappen and Carlos. I could tell from the beginning that Carlos was never going to get ahead of Verstappen because his gap was just never... He was always right on the cusp of like six tenths, seven tenths of a second. Mm -hmm. You got to be a little closer. And I just think it was that Ferrari didn't have the traction coming out of the hairpin. I saw some people on Twitter say that, oh, it was Carlos isn't... He he just doesn't have the skill. I actually I don't that think that true. was the case. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the dissenter here. I think I think Charles could have gotten it done. Really? Yeah, I, mean, like, I, I really do think so. It was you know there was a there was a 
funny moment in the post-race interview where Max said, oh, I made a mistake, and I looked in my mirrors, and Carlos made the same mistake. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, that says a lot. I mean, honestly, we, we kind of know that there's that talent gap, right? We know it's Max versus Charles. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's I, pretty funny. I, 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 yeah, that. I don't think it's definitive for sure, but I do think that there is a little bit of a talent gulf there. You know, we've got um, we've got uh, Charles versus Max, and we've got the battle of the Spanish speakers, as Sergio would say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's let's be a little bit more dramatic. Adam, do you think Lewis, if he was in the Ferrari, do you think he could have closed that gap and overtaken Verstappen? Yeah, quite possibly. You know, I think uh, I think Lewis Lewis and anybody's rear rear view mirrors also makes them nervous, so they're more liable to make a mistake. Uh, you know, yeah. Max is probably one of the coolest guys on the grid now, but even he would lock up sometimes when he was facing uh, Lewis. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think I think we're talking about peers when we talk about Max and Lewis. Lewis is probably even a little bit better given the experience. I don't know when he'll peek over and get, you know, slower on the reflexes like like um. Fettel seems All to right, be. episode over. He just said Lewis is better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, pound for pound, you know, not every race, right? But, uh, you mean, obviously by the end of last year, Max was direct dragging a, a, an inferior car to the occasional victory. So there's, there's, there's definitely a lot of credit to be given there. But overall, I mean, Lewis is the GOAT. So, yeah, I think, I think maybe and he could have done it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about the, the, the fight at the end? The fight was awesome. You know, I have to say that, uh, again, you know, I'm a Red Bull fan. I'm not necessarily like a con- an unconditional Max fan. And so part of me was kind of hoping to see Carlos take his first win. That would have been so meaningful mm-hmm. for him. Sergio's been getting them. Yeah. It, you know, he's due. Might even be the closest he gets because, I, again, I do think maybe there's like a bit of a skill delta between them. So, you know, when Charles isn't taking a new engine, he's probably going to outclass Carlos, you know, nine times out of ten. Yeah. Speaking of being a Red Bull fan, mm-hmm. what was the moment that, what you know, whatever feed do you guys watch? Do you get Crofty and Brundle as the commentators? Um, I, you know, it doesn't seem guaranteed. I have F1 TV. This time I got Jolie and Palmer. But sometimes oh, I certainly exciting. get Crofty and Brundle. Yeah, I, I don't know what decides it. It's really weird because I'll be on F1 TV. I got Jolie in this time. And then after the race, I watched the highlights from F1 TV, my same subscription, and I got the replay with with Crofty and Brundle. So whatever. Anyway, there was a minute where Crofty, he mixed up Verstappen and he called him Vettel in the Red Bull. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) And I was just like, oh, it is a bit of a blast from the past, isn't it? And, you know, all this stuff of like Verstappen... To have now has more podiums with Red Bull than Vettel ever did and all this sort of things to me that mm-hmm. really sort of cements that we are in a completely different time to the Formula 1 that I used to watch totally um, yeah so many so many races now too yeah in many ways that that stat gets juiced yeah yeah but uh yeah and I saw you guys in your one minute assessment say this could be the new Vettel era and um I, I think it's going to be way too close. You know, I think you know, this ride height thing might actually hamper Ferrari a little bit, but I'd like to think that it's going to be tight for years between the two of them. Well, why do you think that? And I because hope that Mercedes and Alpine catch up. To me, it seems a lot. I mean, may, okay, next year, maybe yeah, Mercedes catches up. Maybe McLaren catches mm-hmm. up. Who knows? But this year, how can you think that it's close? Like, it seems like Red Bull is literally, he's got one hand on the trophy. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of time. Oh. Guys, honestly, it's so early. This the, the pendulum has swung both ways. Do you remember when it looked hopeless for Red Bull? Yeah. And they had yeah. count, countless... It's but so darn early. Is. Red Bull now, again, has one more retirement than Ferrari. Yeah. Again, yeah. the reliability is totally not there. And Ferrari, are, I mean, Charles specifically, is qualifying on pole again and again and again. If they can make his car last to the end... Yeah, I, I just don't see. Maybe we're we're both really hard on the teams that we <laughs> that we favor because I, mean, I think Mohammed and I both talked about the fact that in in our chats, yeah. you know, he's really really hard on Mercedes because he loves them, and I feel the same way. Whenever Helmut Marco goes and runs his mouth in the media, I'm like, oh my god, you're cursing us all. <laughs> he's, he's 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 unbearable. It's unbearable. That hubris is just like begging to be to be crushed. But yeah, I just. You know, yeah, it could be that I just um, I worry for my boys, but I just think that the Ferrari qualifies better, and Charles has had a bit of bad luck. He's just, but he only has as many retirements as Max does now. 
I think there's every reason to believe he'll win Silverstone and mm. uh, plenty so, more races. I think we're sort of we know there's going to be a fight at the front of the championship. Um, it'll probably mm. end up being Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercedes in the top three. But let's look at the rest of the field. Who do you think is going to occupy position number four in the constructors' championship? Yeah, for me, that's got to be Alpine. It's not. It's not a total lock. You know, every once in a while we see what is this third row lockup from Haas out of nowhere. Yeah. Started this series very well, <laughs> um, and then you see even Aston Martin. You know, they've gone to the Green Bull format now. Suddenly, Fettel's putting in the top three in the wet. Um, and maybe when they get that stuff sorted out, when they become go from pink Mercedes to green bull, yeah. even if it's mostly cheating, they could end up being fourth <laughs> over it. Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't rule that out. You know, unfortunately, my, in, my, in my fantasy team, I took Valtteri out for Lance because of how well they were looking in the early practices. And while uh, it didn't pay off for me, I am second in your league now. So I would maybe I would have been first if I had kept Valtteri. But uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel Aston Martin might greatly surprise us. But if I had to bet, I'm going to have to say Alpine because this is now the second race in a row they've been fastest on the straight. Yeah, I was going to say um, with McLaren and... because right now Alpine is four points behind McLaren. McLaren has mm-hmm. all of the team organizational problems of Ferrari and none of their speed. So they're just like, like I don't know yeah, what sure. happened this week with their double stack from hell that was just so bad. But it's been like that for now. A few races where there is like a power issue or a cooling mm-hmm. issue or something. Um, you know, DNFs or bad strategy. And they're just not able to keep their car ahead. And, you know, I don't think they're going to... I don't think they have the consistency. I don't see them pulling yeah. it together the way other teams might be able to pull it together. So I do see all totally agree. fourth. Which is really... You know, it's not... It's like if for McLaren to be in 2023 in the championship, then 2021 fourth, and then this year to finish fifth, I think would be really heartbreaking for McLaren yeah. since they had really yeah. worked their way back up. Um, I, I agree with Adam that I think Alpine is going to be the team that finishes fourth because I think they're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. McLaren, I think, had a strong start, but they look a little bit lost. I don't think they'll get fourth, but the team that has really impressed me the most is Alfa Romeo. I think they're just doing a quietly competent job. Valtteri seems mm-hmm. much more relaxed. He's enjoying being a team leader. Um, Joe is doing a really good job. You know, he's had a second point finish. I think he would have had more if it wasn't for bad luck. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and this is a team that finished eighth and ninth in the last couple of years. They're now sixth. And, you know, for, I think if they finished in sixth place, that'd be a huge achievement for them. And so for me, that's the team that I'm sort of most impressed. With. I think Alfa yeah. Romeo is what Williams wishes they could be. Yeah. <laughs> you know oh, yeah, I mean? maybe they will be. Did you hear about this uh, rumor that they might be taking Renault engines starting next year? Yeah. I hope they do, because I think that would be good for Alpine. Mm-hmm. It would also be good for Mercedes. Apparently now with all these caps and whatnot, um, Toto's saying it's no longer very rewarding to be a yeah. a, uh, a manufacturer for them. Interesting. Yeah. For, for other teams. So he's happy to let one go. Yeah. So I wonder, so okay, Arfa, you think Alpine, then McLaren, then Alfa Romeo, or do you think Alfa Romeo will take McLaren's spot as well? Uh, if Alfa Romeo overtook McLaren, Ricardo would <laughs> be in IndyCar next year. <laughs> that, that's what's happening. <laughs> I'll give you my prediction, which is that Alpine is going to catch up. They are actually easily the worst on most of the oscillation graphs. Yeah. So these rules might really crush their straight line speed, unfortunately. But I want it for them, so I'm going to vote with my heart here. And then just to be controversial and different, I'm going to say Aston Martin is going to, to shock. The Green Bull is going to be amazing. Hmm. And I'm going to say that in order for Ferrari to recapitulate the lead, they are going to start doing a bad job of serving Alfa Romeo and Haas and give <laughs> engines. And because uh, they're just sketchy enough, right? Yeah. yeah. So they're going to start giving like mediocre products to their customers <laughs> because they can't handle the work, the demand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Haas is interesting. Haas has a lot of potential, but. They're a little bit like McLaren where they're not able to get their cars to the end. They set it up. No, you know what they're like? They're like Williams in 2020 where George Russell is pulling out these Q3 performances, qualifying really well, but the car, as soon as the race starts, just sinks slowly to the back. And I think that's what is going on with Haas this year. So my prediction is 
Alpine in fourth, I think. McLaren, then Alfa Romeo, then Alfa Tori, then Austin Williams. Alfa Tori has the potential, but their cars have the like the fragility of Red Bull down to a pack. Like they they just keep not yeah. making it, and I, I'm not sure I think why. They're not using enough duct tape. That's the yeah. problem. It's a, it's such a shame too because I think Yuki gets my um, most improved driver of the year award. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yuki's Speaking of great. drivers that need to improve. Last thing before we move on to the next section. What do you both think of Mick Schumacher? Oh, um, he seems like a nice boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I feel so bad for some of these folks who, who don't have the cars to prove themselves sometimes. I mean, certainly when he's put next to Kevin Magnussen, it's not looking great. He was supposed to be the gentleman who you took, took one year to, to figure out the car and another year to perform. But F1 isn't like that because of how yeah. how different the cars are in performance. I suspect that he is talented. I suspect even Nicholas Latifi is talented. These are guys who won yeah. F2 races. I think sometimes so. Sometimes handily. Um, and it's just so hard to judge when they don't have the proper machinery. I think last year it looked like Mick was doing a good job. I think it's the Kevin Magnussen coming into the equation that's caused trouble for Mick. I'd give him till next year to see what's going on. But the random, super weird prediction that I'm going to throw into the mix is if Mick continues to have struggles and doesn't mm-hmm. make it, I think he will go to IndyCar and it may be to get a Schumacher back into a Ferrari, Ferrari may suddenly have an IndyCar program. Because they're looking at IndyCar in their R&D section right now anyway. And the way McLaren have gone back to IndyCar. And I think that would actually be quite cool to have a Ferrari at the Indy 500 won by Mick Schumacher. Wow. <laughs> That'd be cool. I, so I think it's funny that Gunther Steiner keeps going out there and saying the media and the press are trying to split me and, and Mick. They're trying to spread t- tear us apart. But we're a family. We're a strong family. We'll always be together. Oh. And yet he refuses to acknowledge whether or not Mick will have his seat next year. So for all of that, he's still not dispelling the rumors. And so I, I do think that... That plus uh, Alpine signing Fernando Alonso for the extension pretty much confirms to me that Oscar Piastri is going to take Mick Schumacher's seat. I think it's, you know, it's pretty much set in stone. That'd be cool. Um, That'd be cool. Or maybe he'll take Latifi's seat. I don't know. But I, 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 don't, I don't think that... For Mick Schumacher and Nicholas Latifi, nothing is certain. Like, they are the weakest link. It would be really cool if yeah. they went to IndyCar. I, as I was saying last episode, these F1 drivers tend to perform so well in the other categories. So maybe he'll do really well in IndyCar. It would be really funny if him and Dan Ricardo go to IndyCar together. That would be hilarious. It really depends with how much money these gentlemen come to because, you yeah. know, I mean, Drive to, uh, Drive to Survive made it look like the German government was even on, on Team Mick. And, of course, Nicky Latifi comes with his money. And I guess that's one of the things that, um, that Oscar Piastri bemoans a little bit is he doesn't necessarily have a huge champion. Mm-hmm. Um, although there's so much goodwill behind him. I have to say, am I the only one? I'm going to take your temperature of the room here. I mean, I feel like <laughs> Nick DeVries has been waiting so much longer. I would much rather see Nick in, in the Williams than, than Oscar. And I feel I seem to be alone. I think he, the, the guy is amazing and has not had his due. What happened? I like that you said, can I check the temperature with Nick DeVries? I once had to yeah. check Nick DeVries when he had a temperature. <laughs> when he was like oh, really? That's amazing. 12, 13. Yeah, I was at the McLaren Technology Center and he, he, he was brought yeah. up to the team doctor being like, he's sick, look at him. And uh, he was fine. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, Do you think I he would like to you? see him in F1. No, of course not. Oh. Um, but I, I, just for that, because I want to be able to be like, you know the, the Leonardo DiCaprio meme where he's pointing at the TV? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want that to yeah. be me. Big like. <laughs> oh, I really want Nick in, and then don't uh, just like. You know, yeah. last year when the Alex Albon Williams seat was open, Toto Wolf made a huge play to try and get Nick DeVries into that seat. But that's the only yeah. time I've ever seen him advocate for Nick DeVries, so I don't know what happened. And he's been doing good. He's like a two time champion in Formula E, so I don't know why Mercedes has forgotten. Is it two time or one time? I think he's one time champion. I thought he was a two-time champion. No, he's won. He just crushed everything and left, just like Oscar. No, he's still there. Um, he's just not doing a... Oh, he, he won Formula 2, and then he won I'm Formula, in Formula e. 2. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Formula 2, e, yeah. And Oscar just yeah. said, I don't need to prove myself anymore. I'll just wait. 
Mm, if if yeah. Williams really are switching to Renault engines, I guess it's going to go to Oscar. But um, I think it's a real Who's shame. Who's the other guy that lost? Oscar, Oscar hasn't done his time yet. He's still like, he looks like he's 16. <laughs> <laughs> Lando <laughs> Norris looked like he was 12 until the year he got he into Formula does. 1. No, but he yeah. like, he like got, he his face like matured when he got his yeah. McLaren contract. I don't know. Yeah, the McLaren contract will do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so as soon as you say that, papaya. <laughs> so speaking of people that have been forgotten about, one person who has not been forgotten about by Sky F1 is Christian Horner, and we posed this question to our fans. We're trying to pose a question to our fans every week. Uh, so if you guys want to get called or shouted out on our episode, uh, respond to our question prompt on our Twitter at Slow Pit Stop, and we'll be sure to read out your response. Our question this week was, what's the real reason Sky F1 consistently brings on Christian Horner every single race weekend? Actually, every session of every race weekend. Arfa, you had an interesting theory using numerology. Do you remember it off the top of your head? Yes, I worked it out this week. So, um, you know how uh, Christian Horner and... Uh, Toto Wolf bully Matteo Bonotto. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because he's the, the sort of nerdy engineer. Well, just keep keep that in the back of your head That's for a right. second. <laughs> so if you take the alphabet and you go A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3, blah, blah, blah. So Christian <laughs> Horner adds up to, what was it again, 179. Um, and then 1 times 7 plus 9 is 16. And then if you do the same with the word sky, that's 55. So 16 and 55, those are the two Ferrari cars. This is all being set up by Ferrari so that the public will hate Christian Horner. This is how Matteo Bonotto is getting back at Red Bull. Mm. Wow. Genius. Ingenious. That, that's my theory. I, I think it's just the simplest and most obvious. Yeah, um, yeah, obvi- yeah. And definitely. therefore, probably the most correct. <laughs> Adam, you are our resident Red Bull fan. We bring you into our episodes to give us to make it look like we are inclusive and uh, all encompassing. Mm-hmm. What? Why do you think Christian Horner is you know on Sky F One? Do oh you don't watch Sky F One, so you don't know, but he is on Sky F One all the time, like mm-hmm. literally all the time. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I mean, look. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's because he starts every sentence like that, and it's very soothing and predictable. <laughs> he's just, you know, got a cup of coffee in the morning. No, I don't know. I mean, he's got he's got the presenter voice. I think, um, you know, Sky F One just wants people with more English accents that will just slide right into their mold. <laughs> um, that's that's what we say on the outside is the reason, but the real reason is that Jerry Halliwell is calling in favors. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think that, you know, they just really like each other. They, they all just really, they're all friends, uh, you know, out, uh, off camera, they're all friends. And like, you know, when you're friends, you just want to talk to each other all the time. So they're like recording this commentary and they're like, hey, you know what? Let's see what our friend thinks about it. So that's why they call Christian Horner. Let's see what our fans thought. At Manti V1607, Manti Verma said, he does not have much to contribute on the pit wall. So he has the time. <laughs> Constructing that Max should have a better strategy does not really take a lot of time. Yeah, he's not doing anything on the pit wall. What does he do? He just sits there and watches the race like the rest of us. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that right, our fight? No, he's, he's not doing anything important. Um, <laughs> at the, That's right. At the JGG01, Jed, he said, because they know he'll give his own hot takes. He always has an opinion on just about anything. It doesn't seem to have the presence of mind to stay silent. Or he just loves steering the pot. But they ask him. It's the not his fault. Master. They ask him about everything. It's not necessarily that. Like, he's not coming on and saying, hey, I want to talk about Haas. They're, you know, Haas will DNF. And then they'll be like, and now Christian Horner, for your expert analysis, why has Haas DNF? Like, he's like, they just ask him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, David Fontana said, saw this a few years ago. If you haven't seen it already, it's it's a meme of that little British boy from the Platinum Jubilee screaming with the, the caption, me every time Sky F1 says, now let's hear The from little Christian. British boy, the, the prince. prince. <laughs> oh, is that what he is? Is he a prince? Oh, I thought he was a sailor. <laughs> uh, what? What kind of sailor? It looks like he's wearing. Job. That is a sailor's outfit. <laughs> But that's how you have to dress your little boy. Didn't we all have this growing up? No. Sailor outfit? Oh, I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> Thankfully, I'm kidding. I do groan every time Sky Upon says, and now let's hear from Christian. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, no! Why? You oh, know, man. if it was only, like, very lucky in Red Bull-specific conversation bits, I would really like it. Like, imagine every time there's some issue you could hear directly from the, the team principal. I think that would be really cool. But it's just, it's so much. And I feel a little bit like little British boy here in this picture, <laughs> holding his ears. <laughs> you know what he's doing, R5? Did they ask him during the race? Yeah, yeah, during the race, yeah. He they starts were... giving, like, commentary through the yeah. race. I mean, good for him that he's not giving up strategy by mistake. That sounds... <laughs> no, but, you know, it's so funny because he'll, he'll, be, he'll be giving, co- like, his answer. And as he's doing it, Verstappen will get on the radio and be, like, you know, left graining or something. And he'll be like, okay, I have to go. Yeah. I need to deal with this. Like, like yeah. it happens all the time. So, I don't even, I don't know. But, um, I, I know, gotta go, guys. My kid's calling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> Um, Ar- Arfa, you know what this little kid is doing that it reminds me of, and I don't think Prince Al- Louis. For anyone that wants to know what Mohammed's <laughs> talking about, it's the meme of Prince Louis screaming at the Jubilee. Do you know what he's what it looks like he's doing? And I think only a very small percentage of our listeners will get this. He's right. calling Muslims to prayer. I was gonna say he's calling the Adhan, which is really cool. Good for him. <laughs> Good for him, little little British boy. What's his name? King Louis. King Louis Prince the Prince Louis. Prince Louis. Um. And then Dave Fontana continues, it's purely to feed his ego. You see him hanging around all the time in Martin's Gridwalk, etc. Please come to me. The rides on the horses with Jerry Howell and DTS, all just to feed the massive ego. I think it's because he needs to wrap Red Bull everywhere he goes. It's not his ego's fault, it's Red Bull's fault. Uh, Super Nats at Natalie Andrews said, he's got their nudes. Oh boy, that's, uh, that's, that's a whole a can. He's got a lot of likes. That's uh, it. Did get a lot of likes. That is uh, our <laughs> F1 gossip topic for next week. Whose nudes does Christian Horner have? Uh, Ed Johanny ninety eight said, "Easy. He makes himself available for Sky. And to be fair, he is the boss of the current world champion and leading both championships. And he's never holding back. So it's entertaining, even when he talks sometimes. Um, Alfred, you can censor that out. But I." You know, that would be fair, but Toto Wolf never took on air in the middle of the race interviews when he was leading both championships. So I do Huck think... Mark used to do it when he was at Alpine, didn't he? No. Oh, Where did he, race? Mean, he uh, did. Racing Point? Yeah, when he was at Racing Point, he used to do something. He did, some. used to take it. You're right. He And you know, a, f- a few races ago, Mattia Bonato actually took it too. And uh, I remember then Cro- Crofty was like, Mattia Bonato is our visiting team principal of the week. He'll be giving us our answers this week. Implying that every week they bring on a different team principal, which is an absolute lie. That is not yeah, the case. It's like 70% <laughs> Christian <laughs> Horner, 30% everyone else. That's like specials of the week at hospital cafeteria. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. It's still just something beige. <laughs> you know, <laughs> something <laughs> beige made of potato. Whenever either of you talk about your hospital experience, it's so identical to mine. I can't believe how universal these things are. It's so funny. It's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. At uh, Farinho underscore 10 says they're sleeping together. Yeah, like I said, they're best friends. I think, you know, all best friends sleep together. It's just how it is. At Lynn of Earth said, the lads in the commentary box are in love with him. They always ask him first, and he's so happy that he's. they think he's awesome. All the others don't care about the media, especially during a race. I really think the other team principals do not care to answer, and Christian Horn is the only one who's like, yeah, well, why not? <laughs> it's not hurting me right now. So, I don't know. What do you guys think? Is that? Why? I would guess that Toto is uh, too cautious to re- accidentally reveal some strategy, whereas yeah. Matia is gen- genuinely just too awkward. <laughs> I think that's probably true. You know, it is yeah. very impressive that, you know, Christian Horner will say in his, like, in-race uh, question and answer session, he'll be like, oh, yeah, I really think the two-stopper is the way to go today. And then he'll put Max on a one-stop. Like, he is just, he can really separate Ooh. the two things. Yeah, you know, it's pretty So he's a Lewis Hamilton of his team with yeah. pure misdirection. I see. Yeah. That's... <laughs> yeah. Um, at Pranusha Ready 93 put a gif of, uh, who is this? Who is this lady spending money? Chloe Kardashian. Just full... I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's Kim K. I, I don't want people to yeah. think I'm a complete idiot. Uh, at Ranjani M said, Horner is a perfect fit in the Sky <laughs> Echo Chamber. Uh, he is the Echo Chamber, actually. He kind of just... Oh, you know what? Actually, I disagree with Ranjani. I thought this week was really interesting. Crofty had a little back and forth with Christian Horner. He was trying to get him to admit that he was being hypocritical by trying to change the cost cap midseason, but not being for the bouncing midseason, which I think was pretty good journalism from uh, Crofty right there. 
Uh, he, j- he kept trying to get uh, Horner to say in the same sentence, like, yes, I support changing the cost cap midseason, but I do not support changing the regulations midseason. So, <laughs> but yeah, Christian Horner wouldn't say that. But it was a good attempt. Um, let's see. At love underscore music 23 said, all the other team principals are focused on the task at hand. And at virtual safety car, virtual safety Clive said, because he's the only team principal who bothers to take the time. Okay, but why do we need, if we're only going to have Christian Horner, why do we need a team principal on at all? You know, it could just be like F1 TV doesn't have, they're not calling in like, I don't know, who's the guy, Yas Capito for Williams, not calling in him to to make a, a statement. So you, you kind of, you don't need someone. That would be amazing though. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, Arfat? It'd be more cool yeah. to listen to, you know, like, strategy engineers or these sort of people because like you said if if it just becomes generic non-talk again and again and again it becomes boring because it's not adding anything whereas if people actually say or you know maybe it's a, a retired race engineer or a retired strategy engineer that says if i was sat on the red bull wall these are the things that be going through my head this are the process that we go yeah. through and it sort of enhances our sort of enjoyment while we're watching Whereas all we're getting right now is almost like a politician. You know how they speak, but they don't actually say anything. Yeah. We're just getting random sound mm-hmm. bites for the sake of it. And I think that's why it's irritating to people. Because even if it was the team principal of a rival team that you didn't like, if they're giving you new information or, or a, a, an interesting insight into things, then you'd be like, oh, actually, I quite like hearing this. Whereas all we're getting is just sound bites of nothing. Yeah. Do you think there's a solution to this, Adam? I know it's a problem you just heard about right now. (laughs) (laughs) Fix it. (laughs) Intervene. Where will you put the wire to fix Christian Horner? (laughs) Uh, Christian Horner is one of those things that reoccludes no matter what you put in it. And that's that's because because you, uh, you absolutely cannot treat... The occlusion without addressing the source. Does does Christian Horner have any of his own opinions, or are they just all regurgitated um, Helmut Marco opinions? Oh. oh gosh, that's that's the issue. You I know, think uh, Helmut is the media king. <laughs> they probably have a little huddle, and he's like, <laughs> "Okay, young Padawan, let me tell you the art of misdirections this week." <laughs> <laughs> I will say that up until this episode, I really, you know, I dunked on Christian Horner all the time. I thought he was media hungry and dramatic. And I've, I have to come to terms with the fact that Total Wolf is equally dramatic. I can't believe it. He's on oh, yeah. camera. I, come on. <laughs> I didn't think he would. I thought, I. you know what? I guess I was mistaken. Um, Speaking yeah. of Total Wolf being dramatic, I know we're Mercedes fans, but I saw a meme this week that actually made me laugh quite a lot. And it was the clip of Total Wolf from Drive to Survive, you know, at the end of last year, where he's like, everyone has a target on their back. Yeah. And they were just like pictures of like Lewis Hamilton with a sore back and Danny Ricardo <laughs> and Pierre Gasly all holding their backs on their back. That's amazing. That's very funny. <laughs> he wasn't lying, but... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> I, I will say, as a Mercedes fan, this this joke hurts, but it's pretty funny. Uh, I've, there's sure. another clip from Drive to Survive where he's like talking to Russell and he's like, the good news is you'll be in a Mercedes. The bad news is you're racing Lewis. And people have changed it around too. And the good news is you're racing Lewis. And the bad news is you're in a Mercedes. So and that's I, and it hurts, <laughs> but it's pretty, it's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> we have tried to predict the future of the season and where all the teams will finish. We ask you guys to do it every week in our Formula 1 Fantasy League. Uh, let's see who won this week. This week's winner for the Canadian Grand Prix was... Custom Creations 1, uh, Tim S. I wonder what kind of custom creations he puts together. What do you guys... L- let's mindlessly speculate while I look at his team. W- I think he builds custom birdhouses. Beautiful. What about yeah, you? I was going to say, it cars. sounds extremely quaint, small town kind of name <laughs> or something. So I'm going to assume it's, uh, it's essentially uh, handcrafted teddy bears that all smell of potpourri. Very, very Can you nice. imagine... An F1 car as a birdhouse, 
And when the bird sits in there to eat the seeds, it looks <gasps> like the bird is sat driving. Oh the my god! That would be amazing. Let's get this guy to build it for us because that's what he does. He had. I'm really down. <laughs> I love it. He had a. Uh, how many points did he have this week? He had 206 points this week. His constructor was Ferrari. Uh, his team was. Lewis Hamilton, wow, that's, you know, the first time that's probably paid off. Carlos Sainz, his turbo driver. Pedro Gassioso uh, with 11 points. Magnussen and Schumacher. Why did Schumacher lose two points? Oh, because he DNF'd. Uh, sad time, Schumacher. Uh, that was his team. He is going to be getting a free print of the Canada Grand Prix track. That's correct, right? I thought we still have tracks yes. that we're handing out. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so that is our Formula 1 Fantasy. If you guys want your own track because you didn't win or just because you like 3D printed tracks, be sure to hit up Little Prince 3 d on Etsy and use code SLOWPITSTOP to get 10% off. You can get a really nice Canadian track. If you don't want a 3D printed version of a Canadian track, this is what you do. You take a rubber band, you drop it on your table. That shape, that's the shape of the Canadian track. So uh, that, that's the other thing you could do. <laughs> Otherwise, and if you don't accept that, we will go to Kuwait and we will find you in grid B. Did you say Kuwait? Why would we go to Kuwait? Isn't that what their flag is? I don't know. Isn't that what their flag is? What is their flag in Kuwait? Isn't it just like stripes and a triangle? Yeah, that's what Ingrid B has. The, uh, oh, Ingrid B. Oh, I wasn't even looking yeah. at Yeah, Ingrid B. Go. Yeah, we're going to go to Kuwait and find you, Ingrid B. Ooh, what you're saying? Hit, hit us up. We're <laughs> trying to give you free stuff. <laughs> <laughs> anyway guys follow us on twitter and instagram and tiktoks at slow pit stop thank you everyone for joining us thank you adam for joining us we'll see you all next week in silverstone bye everyone later guys i'm gonna go enjoy my lewis hamilton brand monster energy drink now i've earned Amazing. it <laughs>